Hey, good morning, let's stand and let's worship the Lord. And we're gonna worship him because he's done great things in our life and we're coming expecting that he's gonna do great things in this worship service today. on this Sunday. We're so grateful for that. Uh, if you have a bulletin, I'd ask you to grab it. You'll notice inside of it is a Connect card, and we'd ask all of you, if you would, to fill the very front of the Connect card out. We'll put this in the little offering boxes that are at the door on your way out. Uh, we would appreciate that very much. On the back of the Connect card, there are all kinds of opportunities for you to communicate with us. Let us know how we can be praying for you for different prayer requests, uh, signing up for different ministry opportunities that are happening around our church and also on the back of the connect card after the uh, sermon today you may you may recognize that you 
need to make a decision, and this is a way that you may choose to let us know about a decision that you're making this morning. We would appreciate that very, very much. One of the things that we're doing today is we're starting the service off wet. We are. Good morning, everybody. Glad that you're here this morning. Uh, we are going to baptize this morning, and I was just talking to Nelson about what the significance of baptism is, that that uh, it pictures something that really happened, that Jesus died on the cross, he came, he lived a sinless life, we stand in the water, he died and was buried, and that's the picture of going down into the water, and then he rose again, and uh, that's how we come into salvation, is Jesus has offered new life to all who believe in him, and, uh, and Nelson wants to give testimony today that he has done that, invited Jesus to be his savior. So come on. Everybody, this is Nelson Duncan, and uh, he's uh, asked Jesus to be his Savior. He's been uh, asking about matters of faith for a couple of years now, and, and uh, finally uh, decided to follow Jesus. And the VBS, he sort of nailed things down, and so uh, we're excited to be baptizing you. So if you want to hold your nose, there you go. Nelson, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's a great way to begin church this morning, and uh, let's continue to put our focus on the Lord and encourage you to pray for Nelson as he continues to walk with the Lord, um, and as we pray as well, remember that we also have a mission team that's in Wyoming, and I'd ask you to be praying for them as well today, so would you bow with me as we pray? Father, we love you, and we thank you for loving us. I thank you that, Lord, you give us the opportunity to come to know you, to be forgiven because of what you've done for us on the cross. Just the demonstration of baptism this morning, that, Lord, we are able to be buried with you, raised to walk in a newness of life. Um, Lord, I, I'm grateful that that's a work that only you can do. And, uh, Lord, help us to not get past that of your grace and your mercy. Lord, I pray that whether it's here in Evansville or whether it's in Cody, Wyoming today, whether it's in Indiana or Indonesia, Lord, we desire the gospel to win. We desire your message have an impact in our own hearts today and wherever it's being preached. We thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me as we sing to the Lord? But 
love the chorus to that song where it sings, the blood of Jesus is enough for me, because honestly, a lot of us, including me, want the blood of Jesus plus something else. That our only satisfaction is, is not found in Christ. We want Christ and something. But we have to declare there is nothing but the blood of Jesus that can help us, rescue us, save us, and lead us unto salvation. So let's be glad for what Christ has done for us.
Let's declare this morning that the only hope we have is in Jesus. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night.
the book of Psalms, chapter 32. Psalm 32, and they're sort of twins in the, the Psalms. Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, both we will preach. Um, we, I will preach. Uh, it'll be preached in this pulpit. I'll get that right in a moment. Um, during our summer in the Psalms. And uh, Psalm 32 is a psalm dealing with David's sin and a, a psalm of confession. World War II was over. The armistice has been signed in Europe and in Japan. Hostilities have ceased. Under the leadership of General MacArthur, the Allies had bypassed many islands of the Pacific in their drive toward Japan. Now, even though the war was over, tens of thousands of Japanese soldiers were still occupying those small islands, hiding in the jungles and in the mountains in the, in the Pacific. The Americans went to the islands and said, the war is over. Peace has been declared. Lay down your arms, come out. But the Japanese thought it was a trick. So MacArthur had the emperor of Japan make recordings, which they broadcasted with loudspeakers into the jungles, saying, the war is over. Peace has been declared. Lay down your arms and come out. And only then did the Japanese soldiers trickle out. The last soldier came out in March of 1974. 29 years after the war was over. They asked him why. His answer was, I was afraid. When sinners sin, that would be us. The natural reaction is to hide and blame. It's exactly what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden made fig leaves, covered themselves up. Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the serpent. What do we do when we sin? We hide. We don't tell anybody about our sins. And when we are accused, it's somebody else's fault. My mama made me do it. Or my wife made me do it. It's my kid's fault somebody else's fault. There's no way it can be on me. Sin will always be paid for. There's something I want you to remember this morning is this. Sin will always be paid for. But it doesn't always have to be the sinner. But sin will always be paid for. There is a blessing that you'll see in Psalm 32. The context of Psalm 32 is David has committed adultery with Bathsheba. He has murdered her husband, Uriah, by his manipulation and conspiracy. And then he goes, to, in Psalm 32, he pens this. What does he pen? I'd like to read Psalm 32 together. Would you be kind enough to stand with me as we read the text? Starting in verse 1, it says, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curved with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Let's pray. Father, I pray in the next few minutes you'd help me to say what I ought, and may your spirit move in this place and among us and among me. 
I need you today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Two points to the sermon. The first is this. Notice the sinner's perspective of sin in the first seven verses. The sinner's perspective of sin. The first thing you'll notice in the first two verses is the pleasures we feel when sin is clean. The pleasures we feel when sin is cleansed. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there's no deceit. He, the psalmist David uses four words to describe sin. Notice the four words. Verse one, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. Transgression means a rebellion or a revolt against lawful authority. When children that understand, um, have you ever noticed you don't have to, to, to you don't have to teach children the word no? It's almost like it's almost like that's one of the first words they learn. Mama, da da, no, no, they learn that early. Why don't they learn yes, ma'am? Never found that child. Why? It's almost like we're born transgressors. Shocking, isn't it? That you have to teach children to do right. Because we, we are born with this idea that rebellion is in us. Tell me, tell me don't touch wet paint and what comes over me. Oh, I just want to touch it. Tell me not to do something, and immediately I think, well, what if I do? Why not? I recognize that there are people in this room who you're, you're rule keepers, and yet somewhere in you, you're still a transgressor. Notice the second word, still in verse 1. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. The word sin is miss the mark or someone who falls short. Something is always missing in our life. There's a defect in us. We are always coming short. We, we never measure up to God's standard. This is, I, I had someone not long ago tell me that they disagreed with me when I said this. I, I I know I sin every day. I have a thought I shouldn't have. I have an attitude that creeps up and often I do things I shouldn't do. I'm a sinner. I fall short of God's holy standard consistently in my life. I wish that was not the case. And I believe that I sin less than I did years ago and I certainly sin differently than I did before. I I sin differently than I used to, but I still sin. And the sin that I, 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 I have in my life where I fall short, grateful that verse one exists because there's forgiveness available. Notice the third word that's described. It's in verse two. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. The word iniquity is for a word that means perverseness, bent, or crooked. The human nature is warped. Human nature is bent. Human nature is twisted. It's not straight. It's not true. Every person who has ever been born is a sinner. Mother Teresa was a sinner. Billy Graham was a sinner. Every person is a sinner. I think that it's important for us to remember we all have iniquity in us. The fourth word is the word at the end of verse number two, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Some versions use the word guile, deceit or guile. Where we're insincere, we're cunning, there's a duplicity of our human nature. We cover stuff up. When David committed adultery with Bathsheba, he manipulated the murder of Uriah. He, he fell short of law's human demands. And after these acts, what did he do? He hid. Months passed from the act of adultery to the announced pregnancy of Bathsheba. 
That's what took place. He had a duplicity within his human nature. I, I, I know that this is, gets to be a touch uncomfortable, but I think everybody can be a manipulator. We have a tendency to want what we want and to do what we need to get what we want when we are bowing ourselves towards sin. Why? You're deceitful. But then there's this word in verse 1 and 2. Watch it. I'll see if I can emphasize it. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there's no deceit. You can be blessed. The word blessed means happy. It's a divine enrichment that doesn't have the feelings always attached. This person who's blessed, their sin is forgiven. Their sin is covered. Okay, so, so imagine with me, you, you have in your life on a board, whatever your sin is, lying, manipulation, deceitful, hateful, prideful, arrogant, lustful. These are all sins of the heart. What, 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 if, what if you've stolen what if you've cheated? What if you've committed adultery? What if you've been violent towards your neighbor? Whatever it is, imagine with me that all of that gets wiped away. Imagine with me you're pardoned. It's gone. Blessed, happy, is the one whose sin is, it's not held against you anymore. That's what the word forgiven means. It's not held against you anymore. That sin is covered. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the... We actually sang that. That's the picture. That the only way this covering ever happens is through the blood of Jesus Christ. In 1993... British police accused two 10-year-old boys of the brutal murder of two-year-old James Bulger. The two boys pleaded innocent. The young defendants, 10 years old, responded to police questioning with noticeable inconsistency. The climax came when the parents of one of the boys assured him that no matter what they said, they would always love their child. Confronted with irrefutable evidence linking them with the crime and the assurance of his parents' love, the 10-year-old boy with a soft voice said to the police, I killed James. The miracle of God's love is that he knows how evil we are. He knows every thought I've ever had. He knows every attitude I've ever had. He knows everything I've ever done. He knows every thought you've ever had. He knows every attitude. He knows everything you've ever done. And he loves you. At some point in time, your mind should go boom, shakalaka. God loves you and he knows you more than you know yourself. And what does he do with our sin? He takes it out of sight. He removes it. It won't be out of sight from the gossips. What's, that's what's interesting. Is it's out of his sight, it's not out of your sight. Like, like, like some of you may know each other's sin from the past. My wife knows my sin, I know her sin. But when we take it to God, God doesn't remember it anymore. So like in marriage, you can bring up each other's stuff, but God won't bring it up. Please don't bring it up to each other. That's really bad advice. But what I want you to know is God will never bring it up because he has forgotten it. It's how he works. At the end of verse 2, he counts no iniquity. 
That's a, the phrase counts no iniquity. Is, it's an accounting expression. The bankruptcy of your sin has been taken care of. He takes away your sin. He covers it. He cancels it. And God is the only one who can ever do that. In verse 3 and 4, notice the troubles of sin when you hide it. For when I kept silent, notice that phrase, that's worth underlining. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was dried up by the heat of summer. Just first of all, sin's really hard to hide. It's like trying to hide being pregnant. Ultimately, it comes out. That was a really good illustration, okay? I thought about uh, all week long, how can I say this? You can hide it for a while, but you can't hide it forever. There's a book in my office called Made to Stick. It tells the story about a doctor who was trying to get his colleagues practice proper hand washing techniques Leon Bender Dr. Leon Bender became frustrated when he took a South Seas cruise and observed that the crew on the cruise was more diligent about hand washing than the staff at his own hospital frequent hand washing by doctors and nurses is one of the best ways to prevent patient infections and studies estimate that thousands of patients die every year from preventable bacterial infections Bender and his colleagues tried a variety of techniques to encourage hand washing, but the staff's compliance with regulations was stuck about 80%. Medical standards require a minimum of 90%, and his hospital was due for an inspection from the accrediting board. They had to do better. One day, a committee of 20 doctors and administrators were taken by surprise when after lunch, the hospital's epidemiologist asked them to press their hands into an agar plate, a sterile Petri dish containing a growth medium. The agar plates were sent to the lab to be cultured and photographed. The photos revealed what wasn't visible to the naked eye. The doctor's hands were covered with gobs of bacteria. Imagine being one of those doctors and realizing that your, that's your own hands, the same hands that would examine a patient later in the day. Don't y'all want to go to see the doctor now? Not to mention the same hands you just ate a turkey wing with. One of the filthiest images in the portfolio was made into a screensaver for the hospital's network of computers. Suddenly, hand hygiene compliance rose to nearly 100%. You know when we start asking for forgiveness? When we start seeing our sin as we should. But here's what happens. I see Dennis's sin. I'll see Fred's. I'll see Larry's. It's really easy to see. I see Ty's. But my own? I, I can look at yours really easy. My own hands. What, 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 what if... What if we start really looking at our own self rather than putting our own hands in our pockets and hiding them? David had written a letter to Joab telling him to put Uriah at the front of the army and then withdraw from Uriah. You know, at some point, I wonder if David asked the question, where'd that letter go? I have a feeling that letter was one of the things that kept David up at night. I mean, just so that you know, you're not the only one who knows about your sin. David describes physical repercussions of his sin. Verse 3, my bones wasted away. I groaned all day. Day and night, your hand was heavy on me and my strength was dried up by the heat of summer. David was known as a joyful man and as a warrior, and now he describes himself as a man without strength. Sin can affect you physically. This is why when you're sick, there's a passage that says that when you're sick, you should call for the elders of the church. Watch it. We'll put it in James 5. It says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Anyone among you sick? 
Let him call for the elders of the church. By the way, notice who does that. The sick person calls for the elders of the church. The elders don't call the sick person. The sick person calls for the elders of the church and then let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Then watch what happens. The prayer of faith will save the one who's sick and the Lord will raise him up. Watch, 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 watch. If he's committed sins, why is that there? Because sometimes, why are they sick? If he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Sometimes the why there's even physical problems de deals with the issue of our own sin. During the Great Awakening, the Spirit of God was at work across our country. Jonathan Edwards was preaching over a, pa a massive prayer meeting. There were 800 men in a room praying together. And into that meeting, a, a woman sent a message asking the men to pray for her husband. The note described a man who had become unloving, prideful, and difficult. Edwards read that message as it was handed to him. And thinking that perhaps the man described was present, he made a bold request. Edwards stood up in front of 800 men and asked if the man who had been described, unloving, prideful, and difficult, was in the room, if he should repent so that the whole assembly could then pray for him. Would he please raise his hand? Of the 800 men, 300 men raised their hands. Notice at the beginning of verse 3, when I kept silent. Notice the beginning of verse 5. I acknowledged my sin. A new day comes with forgiveness. A new day comes whenever you will simply say, okay, I'm a sinner, I fail. I did it. David received a pardon for his sin once he acknowledged his sin. I did it. I acknowledged my sin. I don't cover my iniquity. I confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave it. Thank you. you, you the, the key to the, the, the deal this morning is that if you want God to pay the price for your sin, admit it. Come out of the hiding. Your hope for forgiveness is for you to ask God for forgiveness. And if you will, he will. And then the passage gives four, four things that will assist you in victory over sin. Verse 6, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time. You want, you want victory over sin? Pray. This is like, well, no duh, Bobby. That's what the passage says. Pray. Be dedicated to pray to God regularly. You know, one of the things I was convicted, I was standing over there while, while I'm singing, and I was singing, and I, I was just asking myself, how much have I prayed for this service and y'all this week? And the answer is not enough. Not enough. Have I prayed for this service? Yes. Have I prayed for y'all this week? Yes. Not enough. And I, I just ask you, how much have you prayed this week to God? We really want victory. We really need to spend time with the one who gives us victory, which takes you to the second. Look at verse 6. Let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when he may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. In other words, there's a time when he's not able to be found, so position yourself close to God. Verse 7, you're a hiding place for me. Run to the hiding place. He's the hiding place. Make sure he's your hiding place. Make sure he's your safe place. When you're in sin, run to Jesus. Don't, don't, you know, sometimes the tendency is to run to your friends, to run to family, to run to work, to run to hobbies. But let me tell you, if you, if you really want victory, run to Jesus. Make him your hiding place. My life positionally is already in Christ. Let me show you a passage. It's in Colossians chapter 3. We'll put it on the screen. It says this. If you have been raised with Christ, picture of baptism. If you've been raised with Christ, seek things that are above 
where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Picture that. Where is my life at? We, 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 did some, we, did some, we, did, we did something as a family. We had never done this before. We, 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 we have a safety deposit in a bank. I, mean, we, I, I feel like we're big time now. We have a safety deposit, and we've been there and took something out of it. So we walked in, did this yesterday, Friday. Friday, went into the safety deposit, had our little key, showed up. So you're in a bank, which is secure. You go to show them the key. They take you back. You take the key. You open up the box. You get the box out. Everything. I, I went through three different things that we had. The building was locked. The next thing was locked. This was locked. But you know where there's more safety than where our passports are kept? I am hidden with Christ in God. And no matter what I go through in life, notice the rest of the passage. When Christ, who is your life, appeared, then you will also appear with him in glory. I may go through all kinds of things in this life, but one of these days I will be with him forever. Why? I'm forgiven. Everything's been wiped clean. It's been wiped clean. Thirdly, prayer. Position yourself close to God. Verse 7, you're a hiding place for me and preserve me from trouble. Peace in trouble is available. Trust in the Lord during conflict. Know that, know that he knows what's going on around you, and you can trust him. One of the verses that I memorized when I was a kid is Isaiah 26, verse 3. It says, you keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. You want peace? Put your mind on him. Trust him. And at the end of verse 7, you surround me with shouts of deliverance. Praise the Lord as he delivers you. Know that the Lord is always at work. But one, of the, one of the failures that I think that happens in our lives is when God shows up and all of a sudden we, are, we come out of difficulty and things are now going well, we don't pause and say thank you. We don't pause and praise him for what he's done. Know that the Lord is always at work. Here's the last point of the message. Notice the Savior's perspective of the forgiven sinner, starting in verse 8. I will instruct you. Oh, wait, wait, wait. The pronouns changed. It said you are a hiding place. Now it says I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. The pronouns changed. Now God is speaking. We are in his classroom, and he's desiring us to learn from him. This is the Savior's perspective. And what's he going to do? He says in verse 8, I will instruct you. I will teach you in the way you should go. You're forgiven. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to give you instruction. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to counsel you. And when we think of his guidance, here's what we often think of. He's going to show us what house we should live in. He's going to show us a career path. And when God is, God is not normally thinking of a career path, he's thinking of a character path. He's thinking about how he wants to form us, not to put me in a new job, but to make me a better Bobby, to, but to make you a better person, conforming you to the image of his son. Notice that it says in verse number 8, I will counsel you with my eye upon you to guide us with his eye. It means that I have to stay close enough to him to see his eye. Um, I, I, I can, this is not a massive sanctuary, but I can see Monica's eye from there. I can't see Ty's eyes very well over there. And that's normally where my wife sits in the second service. If I really want to see her, I have to get close to her. And I can, when I see my wife's eyes, I can often tell what she's thinking about me. 
She can give me a loving look. She can give me a quizzical look. And she can give me the look. If that makes sense to you, would you say amen? Thank you. Now watch this. The only way that's possible is I have to get close enough. One of the greatest problems when we think of he will guide us with his eye is he's trying to guide us. The problem is not his guiding us. It's our position. You want it, you can have it. Get close enough and you'll receive it. Verse 9, don't be like a horse or mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle or it won't stay near to you. Don't be like the beast that can't be controlled. You, you have the opportunity to have the fruit of the Spirit where there's self-control. And then verse 10 and 11, many are the sorrows of the wicked. but Steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Steadfast love and grace is what surrounds the one who is trusting in the Lord. Verse 11, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. You have the opportunity to recognize God's grace is surrounding you. You can rest in that. I have a, when I was, Growing up, my next door neighbor had someone plow through a fence down Deets Road. He found them the next morning. They had fallen asleep at the wheel drunk. I remember waking up and going outside and that there were policemen and I remember going inside telling my mom and then I was not I didn't know you weren't supposed to do this I just ran to where the police were and my neighbor was there Mr. Wright and uh, Mr. Wright said to them don't worry about it not pressing charges. Y'all can deal with whatever things you need to, but on my end, I'm not pressing charges. Okay. What I did not know as a kid at that time was he potentially could have received payment for that fence from them. But in effect, what's he saying? He's saying, I'll pay for the damages that you caused. Somebody, was, if that fence was going to come back up, somebody had to pay. Now imagine with me my life and your life. Actually, I'll imagine my life. You imagine your life. Imagine with me every sinful thought every sinful attitude and every sinful action you've ever had now that's that's big but imagine that somebody has to pay the question becomes who Blessed is the man whose sin is forgiven. Wipe it off. It's not held against you. But let's be clear. Somebody paid for it. If you want it, 
you can be forgiven today. But if you never ask for it, if you never ask for that, charges will be pressed. And one day, you will stand before God and you'll be guilty. You don't have to be. You can be hidden with Christ and God. Would you bow your heads with me? Are your sins covered? Are your sins forgiven? Are you hiding? Are you hiding? You can hide from uh, your neighbor, you can hide from family. you can't hide from God I want to encourage you today call on him and ask him for forgiveness of sin and know that he will not leave you alone you can pray to him he will be there. You can recognize he's your hiding place. You can run to him when you can run to no one else. You can run to him. I want to encourage you today. You can find peace in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your sin, only found in Christ. If you don't know him today, Call on him right now and ask him to forgive you of your sin, to come into your life, to save you. And I want you to know he will. Father, I love you and I thank you for loving us. I thank you for your grace. I thank you that there's hope that we have in you. And I pray, that, Lord, you would help us to be a people who draw near to you. Forgive us for hiding. Forgive us. for not confessing and acknowledging our sin. And help us to recognize that you are what we need. You're the place that we are able to go to when we are in. We're in pain and we're in sin and we don't know what else to do. Help us to turn to you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I really appreciate that, Bobby. Thank you so much. And uh, Bobby's talked a lot this morning about our need for forgiveness and calling upon the name of the Lord. And we'd love for you to do that. We have some folks that are prepared to help you if you'd like to make that you know, your decision this morning. Uh, the pastor will be down at the table here at the front. You can make your way there. Please. Uh, feel free to talk to him. He would really love to talk with you, whatever your story is. Uh, one of our elders will be at the table at the back as well, at the next step table. And uh, you can make whatever decision you'd like to. If you'd like to do like Nelson did today and be follow the Lord in baptism, that's a great next step for those who've trusted Christ. Or maybe you need to accept Christ. Uh, whatever your decision is, would you do that this morning? You can also respond uh, online using the virtual Connect card uh, by texting the word CONNECT to 812-214-1987. Uh, we have a couple of announcements, things coming up very quickly we want you to know about. One is happening tonight. It is our All Church Fellowship tonight uh, at 6 p.m. Uh, it'll be out here behind the building near the lake. We'll have some family games. Uh, we'll have snow cones and uh, cotton candy and hot dogs and hamburgers and so forth. We're asking folks to bring sides. Uh, and so if you have, would bring a side dish, that would be helpful, but uh, it'll be a good time for us to fellowship together. I think the weather's supposed to cooperate with us tonight, and we hope that you'll be here tonight. Uh, it'll be a good time. 
Uh, Tuesday at July, tw July 20th, there will be a women's paint event. Uh, they're painting door hangers. Uh, maybe you painted one in the past and it's time to update that one. Uh, that will be coming up on July the 20th. Uh, there is some cost, so you, uh, let us know if you're planning on attending and you can sign up for that uh, on your Connect card. We are unveiling a new way to register for events here at Northwoods. It's through the Church Center app. We're trying to make it easier to register for things, to get involved with things. And uh, you can download this app. It's a free app. Uh, there is a, uh, a uh, QR code in the bulletin that has a video that will, that will take you to our uh, YouTube channel. And you can see exactly how to use it, what you can do with that. Uh, you can just take your camera like you have done with the menus at restaurants, and uh, you can find that uh, video that explains how it works. If you have any questions, uh, let some, one of the staff know. And then Northwoods will be hosting a marriage weekend on August 21st and, tw first and 22nd. We encourage you to save that date. Uh, we're hoping to encourage couples to grow closer to the Lord and to one another in their marriages. And uh, so it should be a great experience. We hope you'll make plans to attend. And we have been waiting for Awana to start up again. Uh, we have been virtual for the last little while, and uh, we're going to be starting up in person again soon, uh, August 25th, and we're already registering folks for that. So if you would like to do that, you can register uh, through the, uh, the, the app that I mentioned a minute ago, or you can go to the events page of our church website, and we'll get you ready to go. And then our, uh, we are continuing to track uh, gospel conversations. If you've had gospel conversations, let us know that you've had that. You can drop a, a, put someone's initials on a ball in the display uh, in the foyer, or just let us know. We'll drop a ball in for you, and we're hoping to have a thousand gospel conversations this year, and it's exciting to see what God is doing through that. Uh, we have a team that is in Wyoming. Uh, they will be for the next few days, if you would please keep them in prayer as they're continuing to minister there and uh, throughout, the, be coming back this week. And I think those are the announcements. Hope that you can make it tonight. It should be a good time. Uh, we're going to receive an offering this morning, and uh, you can do it a couple of ways. You can drop your uh, Connect card or your offering in one of the boxes near the doors, uh, or you can uh, do that on our website by going to northwoodschurch.org slash giving, and uh, you, can, you can give there. Or you can text to give uh, by texting the word GIVE to 812-214-1987. I think those are the announcements. I think that's all that we're doing this morning. Would you stand with me and let's, uh, let's uh, ask God's blessing uh, on the rest of the day and uh, hope that it's a good day. Thank you for being here this morning. Father, we're grateful for uh, this chance to be together. Thank you for the promise of your word that there is hope, there is forgiveness. And Lord, I pray that your spirit would even now be dealing with hearts that need uh, need your cleansing and your forgiveness. In this room, I pray that, Lord, we would all make peace with you through Jesus. And uh, Lord, I pray for uh, the decisions that need to be made following this service. I pray that they would be made. Lord, we're grateful for this time we have together. Thank you for uh, the power of your word and uh, the power of who you are. We give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Hope you have a good rest of the day.